Everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Now I haven't done any reviews of the Wheel of Time books as it's fairly obvious that I'm a fanboy uh, and so one would assume that I would typically review the books as being pretty good. But obviously I do have opinions on the books and I know the series isn't perfect. In this three-part series I'm going to rank the books in order of their quality in my opinion. In this video we're going to go ahead and start with my least favorite book up to my 11th favorite book to kind of split it up into three sections. Before we get into the criteria I'll use for my rankings, I will tell you that I do find all of the books have their own charm and purpose. And if you have read the books before, I highly suggest going through the audiobooks on your next reread, as Michael Kramer and Kate Redding do an amazing job of bringing the books to life, and the different perspective they give made the so-called slog actually be far more enjoyable. If you want to pick up the audiobooks, I highly recommend taking advantage of the offer that Audible.com is offering my viewers. You can receive a free audiobook just for signing up for a free trial with Audible. You don't have to commit or pay a dime to keep your audiobook, but if you do decide to keep it, you'll get a new book each month from their massive collection and it only costs $15 a month. I have the entire Wheel of Time series as well as a number of other business development books I use in my business. You can get access by going to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus. I'll have a link in the description below. The great part is that by even signing up for a free trial you are helping support the channel. So let's go ahead and throw up a spoiler rating for this video. The video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red meaning that I will be mentioning and discussing events and characters all the way up through the final book, A Memory of Light. So if you have not finished the series, you may want to avoid watching this video. I will not be going to detail with all of the plot points, but there will be mentions. Watch at your own risk. So if you've watched enough of my videos, you know that I can't possibly give an opinion without spelling out my criteria as I am OCD. Uh, so let's go ahead and go through the criteria I used when making my list. We're going to have five separate factors in ranking the books. Each of the factors will be ranked on a scale of 1 to 10, meaning the books will get a total score out of 50. The first of our factors is going to be pacing. Pacing in the literary world is at the rate at which events unfold in the story. It is necessary at times for a story to have a slow and methodical delivery and at other times for it to be action-packed and keep you on the edge of your seat. A well-paced story will have a good balance and will be consistent. It is very noticeable when a story ramps up too quickly or stays slow for too long. Our second factor will be interest to the reader. How interesting is the story or plot? Does it leave you wanting to keep reading? Do you find yourself daydreaming while reading the story because you're just bored with what's going on? So we'll examine that on a scale of 1 to 10 as well. Third, we're going to examine character development. Do we learn more about our characters in depth? Do we see them evolve throughout the book? And then next we'll take a look at the world building. Do we learn more about the world our characters live within? Does the world expand for us as the reader or is it just the same. This could be meeting new cultures or peoples, or simply driving far more depth into a culture that we already know of. And lastly, we'll examine plot resolution and big moments in the novel. Do the plot lines get resolved? Are there big exciting moments that give us conclusions to the stories that we followed and set up further conflict? Does it feel like anything actually happens? So I've decided to rank all 14 of the novels and add the prequel novel New Spring as well. So without any further ado, let's dive into my list covering my 15th through 11th favorite Wheel of Time books. So coming in at number 15 on our list is Crossroads of Twilight, the novel at the heart of the so-called slog of the Wheel of Time. Crossroads of Twilight is actually more enjoyable than most would give it credit for, but it still lands at last on our list. In regards to pacing, Crossroads is very slow and doesn't really pick up pace throughout. It stays fairly consistent in its plotting nature. You sort of wait for the pace to quicken, as it does in some of Jordan's other books towards the end. In Crossroads of Twilight, it just stays the same. For pacing, I'm going to give Crossroads of Twilight a 4 out of 10. For interest to the reader, the book gets a similar score. Rand is in the book very little, and Perrin's storyline is basically just rescuing Fael, and Matt is traveling with Lucas' show. None of these plots are particularly interesting to me. I certainly think that they add value and context to the series as a whole, but these plotlines just aren't dynamic. 
I give it a slightly higher score than the pacing because I find that the reactions to the cleansing of Sidene from everyone else to be mildly interesting. Crossroads of Twilight gets a 5 out of 10 for interest to the reader. In terms of character development, Crossroads does get some slightly higher marks here. There are some good character moments and some point of views from characters we previously haven't gotten to know very well. Learning more about Cad Swain's motivations and desires was great, and Perrin's struggle with torture and violence to pursue his goal of rescuing Fael gives Perrin, a, as a character, more depth. This is really always a strength of Robert Jordan's writing as well as world building, so there will almost never be a low score in this section, but Crosswoods of Twilight gets an 8 out of 10 for character development. For world building, we don't really get introduced to any new locations or peoples, but we do get more depth in the cultures that we already know about. For instance, learning more about the Shan Chan as we see a point of view from Tuan's head bodyguard as he searches for her. Learning more about Andor through Elaine and the politics of securing the throne. Crosswoods of Twilight gets a 7 out of 10 for world building. In terms of plot resolution and big moments, again, Crosswoods of Twilight gets a fairly low score. Very little actually happens in this book. There is not one big moment that wows the reader. No plot line is resolved at all in the book. The biggest moment of the book is really Egwene being captured and the revelation that Rand will meet with the Daughter of the Nine Moons, but as we as the reader know that that's just an imposter posing as Tuon. These are not particularly exciting plot revelations. Uh, Crossroads of Twilight gets a 5 out of 10 for plot. In total, Crossroads gets a 29 out of 50 and earns the number 15 spot on my list. <laughs> Coming in at number 14 on my list, the prequel novel to The Wheel of Time, New Spring. The prequel novel is set 20 years prior to the events of the main sequence and covers Moraine and Swan's journey from Accepted to Aes Sedai and the beginnings of their search for the Dragon Reborn. For pacing, New Spring has a fairly slow beginning and although it picks up at the end, it is not the best of Jordan's books for pacing. New Spring gets a 6 out of 10 score for pacing. In terms of interest, the novel gives us some insight into the workings and specifics of the White Tower and the origins of Moraine and Swan's quest to find the Dragon Reborn. These things are interesting but not pivotal to the story, and they did not keep you super glued to the pages. New Spring gets a 6 out of 10 for interest to the reader. For character development, we really get a focus on three characters here. Moraine, Swan, and Lan. We get the depth of their backstory and a little glimpse into who they are before we see them all polished and grown up uh, to the ways of the world in the main sequence of the novels. Their characters are developed really well here. New Spring gets an 8 out of 10 for character development. With world building, we get to see a lot more of the inner workings of the White Tower, and we also get to see some of Kandor, a nation that we don't see anything of in the main novels. We also get to see the end of the Aiel War and its after effects. This novel is very strong in the world building department and gets a 9 out of 10. Lastly, for big moments and plot resolution, the major resolution lies in the defeat of the Black Aja plot and Moraine bonding Lan as her warder. While these are cool moments, not too much actually happens in the novels that makes us really absorbed into these books. New Spring gets a 6 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, New Spring gets a 35 out of 50 and earns the number 14 spot on my list. So I feel weirdly about Winter's Heart. It simultaneously has one of my favorite moments in the entire series placed at the end of one of the more dull books of the entire series. There are certainly some good moments in Winter's Heart, but this is really mid-slog when it comes to Robert Jordan getting somewhat distracted and going too deeply into subplots. With pacing, Winter's Heart is a very poorly paced book. Much of the book is slow and plotting, with a sudden ramping up of the tension and speed of the novel as we get to the end with the cleansing of Sidene. It feels very uneven and the foreshadowing and build-up just isn't there. It gets a 5 out of 10 for pacing. With interest, the ending is really all that's super interesting about the book. We do get some of Matt that's fun to see as he escapes Ebudar, but not really Matt at his best. Rand's plot in Far Matting leaves much to be desired. But again, that ending is freaking awesome. Uh, the cleansing is a pivotal moment for the novels, and a number of points of view that we get are great. Winner's Heart gets a 7 out of 10 for interest to the reader. As it goes with character development, we get a number of minor characters that get points of view and much more screen time for us, driving some depth into these characters. We learn more about Cad Swain and the mysterious Varen. 
Matt finally discovers who the daughter of Nine Moons is, and we get to see him come to terms with his destiny. Even in the not-so-good books, Robert Jordan really shines at giving depth and complexity to his characters, even the side character. For character development, Winner's Heart is going to get an 8 out of 10. With world building, we do get to see a new place in formatting. The history and depth of the city-state is, is pretty interesting, and we learn more about the inner workings of the Shanchan. Again, even in the worst of his books, Robert Jordan always nails the world building. Winner's Heart gets an 8 out of 10 for world building. And lastly, plot resolution and big moments. There isn't a ton that happens throughout the book that really drives the plot forward other than Rand cleansing Sidene with Nynaeve. Matt escaping Ebudar does bring some conclusion to the Ebudar plotline, but Elaine's attempts to secure the throne and Perrin searching for Fael really just kind of drag. The book gets an 8 out of 10 for big moments, but primarily due to the biggest moment of them all, the cleansing. All told, Winner's Heart gets a 36 out of 50 and gets the number 13 spot on my list. The Path of Daggers is an interesting book, and to the extent that it serves as the bridge between some of the most fast-paced and exciting books of the series, to the beginnings of the so-called slog of the books. The pacing of The Path of Daggers is actually fairly decent, with a decent stream of mild action happening throughout, and quite a bit of battles and conflicts. And we do get some great perspective pieces from each side of the battle, and it gives the battle scenes a great tempo. The Path of Daggers gets a 7 out of 10 for pacing. As interest goes, this is really the only area where I really think this novel struggles. Things certainly happen in The Path of Daggers, and it's not uninteresting, but comparatively to what we have seen in the past five books of the series, the stakes just don't seem as high. We don't seem to think that Rand will actually lose to the Shan Chan, and, and the, or that he will really defeat them either. They don't seem to be menacing to him, and he only fights them with a fraction of his force. The plot lines of this book just aren't on the same scale as defeating a Forsaken, or taking over an entire country or culture. For interest to the reader, Path of Daggers gets a 6 out of 10. When it comes to character development, Path of Daggers is pretty strong, as always with these novels. Rand falls deeper and deeper into madness, and you begin to see how this affects those around him. Egwene asserts herself with the rebels and really becomes the Amarlin. We do see development and depth, so it's going to get an 8 out of 10 here. For world building, again, another strong showing. We see Masima in the Dragon Swarm, and the fanaticism that would certainly be a part of a world that had a long prophesized messiah figure appear and start swallowing up countries in the world. We learn more about the Shanchan military, we see the inner workings of Andorran politics. The world really grows from this book, 9 out of 10. Lastly, for plot resolution and big moments, we don't have a ton of major events, but we do see Rand come to a draw with the Shanchan, despite both sides believing they lost. This is his first major military defeat, but then we get to see a, a pivotal battle with the power in the Sun Palace in Kyrian. We see the use of the Bowl of the Winds at the beginning by Elaine, Nynaeve, the Kin, and the Windfinders. We also see the beginnings of Fael's kidnapping storyline here. If it hadn't dragged on so long, it would have really been an interesting storyline. It just took a book or two too long to end. The Path of Daggers gets a 7 out of 10 for big moments and plot resolution. In total, The Path of Daggers gets a 37 out of 50 and earns the number 12 spot on my list. Really, from this point on, all of the books are spectacular. We are really just nitpicking at this point, and honestly, we're going to be highlighting the books that are especially spectacular, rather than pointing out the flaws of the books. Crown of Swords is a fun book that gets us some resolution on plot lines that have been set up in some previous books. For pacing, A Crown of Swords is very well paced, keeping a fairly consistent tempo that leads to a final battle and showdown with Semiel and the tension that comes with it. There are a couple of major scenes that give some excitement, and it never really feels like it's plodding along. A Crown of Swords gets an 8 out of 10 for pacing. When it comes to interest for the reader, this book is interesting, and almost all of the plots that the book addresses are mildly interesting, but nothing has the wow factor of some of the previous novels. Given that everything is good but nothing is great, Crown of Swords gets a 7 out of 10 for interest of the reader. Character development is also pretty good here. We always get great development, but there are no crazy big defining moments for our characters in this book that make it stand out as an exceptional character development driven story. For character development, Crown of Swords gets an 8 out of 10. When it comes to world building, we get to see the city of Ebudar and learn about the Kin, an entire group of channelers that we had not met up until this point. We go to Ilion for the first time since the Dragon Reborn, and we get to see the inside of Ilion, really. 
The world building is pretty good and the book gets an 8 out of 10. For big moments and plot resolution, Crown of Swords gets a pretty good score. We get to see the resolution of the Semiel plotline as Rand finally kills him with the help of Mashadar and Moradin, and he takes the city of Ilion in the Laurel Crown. We see a dramatic fight with the Golam and Nynaeve breaking her block. We see the girls finally recover the Bowl of Winds. Some big things happen and we get a good bit of resolution. For plot resolution and big moments, Crown of Swords gets a 9 out of 10. In total, Crown of Swords gets a 40 out of 50 and finds itself at the number 11 spot on my list. So we're going to conclude this video right here. What do you think of my list so far? I'll have the next videos out tomorrow and the day after to complete the series, so I am interested to see what you think of the complete list. Before we end the video, I wanted to give a huge shout out to those over on Patreon who are supporting me in what I do here. If you are liking my content, please take a moment to check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description below. Please also take a moment to like the video and subscribe to the channel before you go if you think this video is worth it. And make sure to click the bell icon to get notified when I post new content. Hey guys, until next time, take care. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?